You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect to get some tips and takeaways from each of my special guests. My podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network. It's also available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. And please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. And as a reminder, I do gratitude keynote speaking and gratitude coaching. And you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. Or for you YouTube viewers, you can see thatgratitudeguypodcast.com. Dot com as well. And the contact information and other information will be in the show notes. So let me get on to the show and introduce always my favorite part of the show, which is my weekly guest. No exception this week. Let me tell you a little about Gary. Gary Pelaine is the principal of Osmosis Leadership based in Kirkland, Washington. A native born Western Australian, he began his professional career as a mechanical engineer specializing in power station design, dust pollution control and mine ventilation systems. Gary has over the last 32 years committed himself to a most accomplished career in human engineering. A highly practical and motivating coach, facilitator, and speaker, Gary has been described as, quote, very good at combining processes and people to make an enjoyable learning environment that helped our employees retain and apply the knowledge, end quote. Gary has the unique ability to surface and share ideas and then to coach and inculcate measurable behavioral change in people leading to increases in organizational effectiveness. He's also a past 20 year Vistage chair for a small business group of CEOs and presidents in Seattle. And Gary's the father of two children. He balances his lifestyle by being an active golfer, squash player, and musician. Gary, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Dave. Who wrote that? That was pretty good. Who wrote that? Gosh, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> so, well, for oh, those, I like that guy. <laughs> I want to meet him. For <laughs> those that have watched the podcast or listened to it, I think I've done 75 or 80 now, something like that. I always start the podcast with the same question, and then I end the podcast with a similar question. <laughs> question. But for the benefit of the viewers and listeners, tell them how you and I met. Wow. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, I think you're at the time working with a, um, a fashion designer here in Seattle, and uh, you were curious about uh, Vistage or Tech at the time. Actually, it was called the Executive Committee at the time. It changed its name to Vistage, and I was a Tech slash Vistage chair of a President CEO group, and uh, I also had an Inconnect group, which was um, a group of independent consultant advisors uh, p- people like myself p- people like who you were and um we got to know each other pretty well we sort of connected in a good um a physical sort of chemical chemistry way there it was, it was pretty instantaneous and we just kept in touch and you became part of the internet group and yeah we really got to know each other very well yeah, that's that's as well. I recall the exact same way. Every once in a while, I'll ask somebody how we met, and I'll think, "Oh, that's right. I forgot about this <laughs> element to, of it or something." And, and well, you had yeah. to make me think about it. I, I mean, but that's right. But I remember back to tech before it was called uh, Vistage, and then yeah. the Internet Group, of course, and getting to know those people. And I think it's really been interesting. As I said, you and I kind of connected when we met. And uh, you've helped me a lot in things, and I've spoken for you a few times and give me a lot of connections, which I very much appreciate in the past uh, probably 10 years or so. And one of the things I've always found fascinating, now we're doing Zoom a lot. I was telling somebody, uh, I was at a talk in Phoenix, actually Prescott, Arizona this past weekend, and I was telling the group that uh, I, I was sort of saved by Zoom, and I did 75 talks on Zoom during the pandemic that year and a half. And the reason I bring it up is because just like seeing your face pop up on Zoom and like when you and I first met, it's always interesting, whether it's in person or on Zoom, how you have just kind of a connection right away with the person in the first 30 to 45 seconds, you can tell if you like them or you don't. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just amazing. And, and uh, I remember when I first met you and you got that 
Australian accent and that big smile and always a ready laugh and so forth. So, so you have an American accent, by the way. Did you know that? What's that? You have an American accent. Did you know I know, that? and and you've said that you before, and and I, I that's kind of cocky of Americans to not think it would be an American accent. It's just like the, <laughs> the United <laughs> States of America. We don't have the accent you do, but I've heard <laughs> I've heard that before too. But speaking of Australia, walk back the listeners. I always kind of like to start a little bit in chronological order and mm-hmm. talk about your journey. Not, not so much, you know, growing up in high school, but maybe the college and kind of how you got started on the path that you did, maybe starting around those college years. Yeah, it's interesting because in Australia, not many people go to college. I didn't go to, I went to, te- I, when you leave high school, most kids get a job mm-hmm. and then you go and study your like I did engineering and so on, part-time, I had, I had a, a, a job with a company called Mers and McCullen Partners. They were a very stuffy English company that specialised in infrastructure for the, uh, uh, for the iron ore industry up in the northwest of Western Australia. So I was a junior engineer, uh, got to become an engineer by studying part-time at a technical college, got my engineering qualifications and really stayed in the industry, got into got involved in sales engineering and uh, sold mechanical equipment and then became a management engineering de- uh, company that um, sold, engineered and constructed mechanical equipment for the engineering industry. Hmm. Um, but through that time, I because I was selling, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I was just knocking on doors and talking to people. I didn't know what selling was. I joined a group called SWAP, Salespeople with a Purpose, SWAP. And they met every Wednesday morning over breakfast and had guest speakers every Wednesday morning. It was a really cool thing. And you had to stand up, say who you were, who you worked with, have a thought for the day. And that was my first exposure, David, to personal development. Standing up, speaking on my feet, in front of a bunch of people I didn't really know that well at first. And it was a great training ground for me. It became my crucible of personal development. Swamp because mm. I stayed in it for eight years. I didn't miss a meeting, became national vice president of Swap Australia and did lots of cool things with youth swap with kids in school and so on. Mm. So that became my incubator for what is my passion today, and that is working hard on yourself and you do your job. Yeah, and and I want to talk a little bit more about that, but I want to just jump back to something you said that I don't know if I really realized. You said that most of the people in Australia, the milk, the, the thought process is kind of finish high school and get a job. And I yep. think, gosh, what a contrast to, you know, I always talk about how it's so different from here as an example. But, you know, when we were, I always tell people that when I was born, when you were born, we won the birth lottery because we both had good parents and, and good, grow, you know, growing up. Other people don't. But I think how different from one country to the next, go to high school and get a job. Whereas it seems like in the United States, a lot of us go to college in India. Yep. It's go to college and get a doctorate or get a, you know, there's no, this computer science is second, but you want to be a doctor first and so forth. So how, well, that's just always the way it was. It's just, there wasn't much of an expectology of college, or I think they call it university sometimes too, don't they? Only the blue blood rich people went to university. Interesting. And, you know, that was less than 5%. I mean, you talk about India. I mean, you're probably talking about 1% of Indians go and do that sort of stuff you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, most yeah. Indians don't go to any colleges or greater university. Now, Australia is very unique, and that's the way it was. It's changed a little bit. Uh, I mean, now you're, I mean, you can, we don't have colleges like we have in the United States. They just don't exist. Mm-hmm. They have technical colleges. They have universities. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, a, it's a big gap between the, the curriculum of education between those two entities. But that's the way I was raised, and that's what everybody did. So that's what I did. That's the way it went. And so on to the personal development piece, that obviously attracted you. What was it about that? Was it just figuring out how to motivate and inspire people or just to have a purpose? Or what was it about that personal development that really appealed to you? It wasn't about inspirational motivation or anything. It was about me learning to become me because my my mentor, Jim Rohn, R-O-H-N, if you haven't heard of him, Jim mm-hmm. Rohn, uh, was, a, was a wonderful influence on me. And he, I had breakfast one day in Sydney and he, I asked him, I said, what's the one thing that you can share with me in my personal development? He said, he mentioned that thing about each day working harder on yourself than you do your job. But he went on to say that, you know, you can work hard at your job, Gary, and you can earn a noble living. But if you work hard on yourself, you put yourself in a position to make a fortune. And that really intrigued me. 
And he went on to say, you know, um, it's it, who you become, yes, what he said, who you become is so much more valuable than what you'll ever get. Mm. So I, I, I just worked on me becoming a better me, being a better uh, communicator, connector, being a better salesperson. That, you know, what is sales? It's, you know, just being consultative and, and communicative, asking good questions. That's all selling is. And so I, but I had to learn that. I didn't know selling, just asking questions. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. And I built my 30-year consulting practice about just asking really, really good questions of my clients. That's how I sold myself. Thank God for the, the skill I learned. Well, you know, and then did he, did Jim Rowan, I'm very familiar with him too, did he talk about, at least from his standpoint, some of the things that some of the exercises, workshops, things you could be doing to improve yourself or the types of exercises or things you could do? Well, the only the only thing he did mention, of course, he was always selling his CDs and all that sort of stuff. And right. videos, and, and I bought them all because he was a wonderful philosopher. And I, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing in this country for the last 30 years, my own consulting practice, but it wasn't for him. No question wow. about it. Wow. And, um, but he said, just just keep working so read the books you know study the mentors you know the dr wayne dyers and the dennis waitley's and the zig ziglers even like people like that mm-hmm. and and you know listen to what listen to their stories listen to what they've got to share you know suck it up be uh, be open to curious uh, curiosity and, and see what you find out about yourself and always be looking in the mirror and, and that's that's what i did and quite frankly i just learned a lot of stuff Mm-hmm. The ability to do what I do now is, you know, mainly strategic planning for executive team. That's what I primarily do now. But that gives me great joy. And I, again, there's no way I'd be doing what I'm doing today if I hadn't been for that grounding back in Australia through people like Jim and all those other guys. That's neat. And that's bringing back old memories for me of Zig Ziglar, Dennis Whaley, Wayne Dyer, Tony yeah. Robbins, a lot of those. And I remember listening to a tape. I must have been 23, 24 years old. And it was Zig Ziglar. And this was a cassette tape. <laughs> and I just remember how it hit me. You are in control. It's all about your attitude and the way yeah. he would articulate or enunciate, I should say, attitude and things. And, and but I always found it interesting, you know, each day working harder on yourself, uh, who you become is much more valuable. Those uh, and selling was about asking good questions. Those are such good points, which I'll, I'll probably mention when, when we wrap up, because I always want to look for those takeaways. Yeah. But the thing that's always been fascinating, I've been blessed, if that's the right word, to have managed a lot of people in my life. And I've always been, man, I've always questioned how much is nature versus nurture when it comes to that. And, and you've been around tens of thousands. I don't know what the number would be of the people that you've managed or worked with or coached or what have you. And it's just, it's so interesting to me because for some people, you can give them the exact same work in class and some just pick it up immediately and some really struggle. Just even how to say something two different ways to ask the same question. One is so warm and, you know, and, you know, inviting the other one just as like fingernails on the on a chalkboard but i mean do you feel that everybody can learn that at some point those types of skills those sort of soft skills if you will no yeah I, you know i i do a lot of tech leadership development training for industry associations around the country and it amazes me i mean most people come to these things because their boss has sent them to be better leaders or whatever mm-hmm. and very few walk away with what, I, with what I would call an ingrained strong skill set as a result. Very, very few I, you know, who I catch up with later on or somehow connect with have adopted. Or, 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 I think most people are uniquely aware of some of these things, but to actually, you know, the definition, definition of learning is to apply newly acquired knowledge. Is mm-hmm. the application. Not, mm-hmm. I, I seriously doubt if many people do. Which is a shame. I think there's, there's people like you and I, uh, I think a little unique that way is that I, I was born to learn. I, I, I have no question about that. Learn. And that's why personal development is such a big thing for me. Yeah. And uh, I'm always wanting to listen to someone who's got some uh, different ideas, perspectives, insights to me, because I, it's going to make me better, sharper, you know? And I think so, it's interesting too, the whole, you know, learning, applying the new skills. I've, I've always liked the polar opposites. I think there's know-it-alls and I think there's lifelong learners. 
And mm-hmm. you and I have always prided myself in being a lifelong learner. I can never learn too much. I can never ask that people will say that I talk a lot and I talk fast and I do, but half the time it's asking questions because they'll tell me more about that. I want to hear about that. Well, how did that affect you? And so on. And, and just human beings, and especially in the leadership, I think if you look as a speaker, you'll Google what's the top topic and leadership's usually number one that they want for speakers on that subject and so forth. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's just, but again, back to the people that have that natural ability and some of them don't, but, but I think something else too, you said selling was about asking questions, asking good questions. Mm-hmm. And then that's sort of, to me, that's sort of part A and then part B is listening. And I think, as you said, some of them, they don't, they go to the leadership development training and they get this, this skill set and some get it and some don't. But I was thinking, I just am fascinated, even in this year of 2022, how people just don't seem to listen. And they don't mm-hmm. listen very carefully. And I think it was Wayne Dyer, listen to understand and as opposed to listen to respond. Mm-hmm. And, and so I just think if, if that would seem to me, no matter what your personality type, such an easy thing to do, just zip your lip and listen more. Wouldn't but it's not easy. No, particularly we men, we're hopeless at it. Mm-hmm. Most men I know are really, really bad listeners. And in my opinion, David, you have got to learn to ask open-ended questions and be genuinely curious before you mm-hmm. learn about listening. Until you learn how to ask good, open-ended, well-crafted questions. And there's only four question types in the English language. And if you can learn those four, you can really open up communication instead of shut it down. We as men typically are pretty bad at that. We mm-hmm. want to, we're born on this planet to hunt and kill shit. That's what we do. Right. We're not right. here to listen and absorb and be curious about people's stories and people's histories and people's insights and we've got to we've got to do a better job of it uh, or else you can't listen and you you're you're old, you can't listen. oh sorry as i wasn't listening there no i was listening uh what are the four what are the four types of questions i like that i want to make sure i got that down you said there's only four types of questions yeah. open and yeah. well-crafted yeah neil racker from the hathroid institute did some great research back in the 70s and 80s and he identified with all that research that there's only four question types background questions which are just simply you know so how's your day going what do you think of the game on the weekend that type of stuff um the, the second type is problem questions where you don't you don't use the word problem but you ask people so you know what's what's on your mind what, what's keeping you up at night what's the biggest issue or frustration or challenge you have on your plate right now in doing the job you do that's a problem question and that's a critical question to ask because that's where the meat of any conversation is is you know what are you struggling with what are the issues around your life right now that's not working for you very well? The third type of question is the one question that you just don't hear anybody ask, and they're consequence questions. So, Gary, what's happening as a result? If that's an issue that's really bugging you right now, what's going on as a result? So tell me more about that. What's that leading to? Who else is impacted by that? So you're asking a series of consequence questions. Once you understand what the client or the person you're talking with is struggling with it's it's you being even deeper more deeper curious by asking consequence questions and the last type of question is value questions where you say well so if there was a way to move forward what would that look like what might be a next step you could uh, you could put in place to make that happen so then now we're going from the from an from the negative to more to the positive hope and possibility with value questions so if you can if you can learn how to ask those four question types and have a a structured conversation around that and which i do with my clients very consciously very consciously whenever i go and see, meet a, a new potential client i follow that process to the right to the end because at the end you just say well i think i have a pretty good understanding of what you what you what you're struggling with and what you're looking for that's what i can that's what we do you know where do you want to go from here and then we just go from there it sells itself and you mentioned that men are, are, are worse than women, and especially with all your experience. And we think back on that. What, if you were to put your psychologist, therapist, psychiatrist hat on, Dr. Polane, is it insecurity? Is it self-awareness? Is it self-esteem issues? Why, is, why are people just not that good at listening and, and asking the better questions? Everything you just said, as well as I, we have never learned or been taught. I mean, I went to school and I went to technical college and I, it wasn't until I really got into personal development and met people like Alan Barker and 
and these guys, people like Neil Rackham and people like that, who, who teach you how to ask these questions. And they, they teach you to listen and lean in. I mean, who's that? Is Brené Brown? She talks about mm -hmm. leaning in and being right. authentic and real and so on. But the only way you can open up to someone who might be, you know, connecting with you is by them being generally curious. Yeah. And so the bottom of my goal sheet every year, I have written down a big bold cap of print, be an artisan, learn to be an artisan of genuine curiosity. Mm -hmm. if, I can, if I can do that with genuine curiosity it, on every conversation I have with people, it tends to connect very well with people. People tend to get drawn to people who are genuinely curious. Yeah. And I think you have to really be a very good listener to sort of back that up because it's just... Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I've watched so many people that, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, what I wanted to ask you, and they haven't heard a word you've said, you know, and again, sure. it's back to I'm preparing my response and so forth. In fact, speaking of genuine curiosity, I, I read somewhere that Bill Gates Sr. was asked about his very famous, at one time, the richest man in the world son, Bill, and he said he had never seen anybody as curious, you know, with the high level of curiosity that Bill Gates Jr. had. You know, and, and that's I just think that's so neat because well, tell me more about that. In fact, which which triggers something that you just said when you say ne they have never learned to ask the right questions and so forth. Like, tell the listeners a little bit about something. I'm thinking back to the Inconnect group and different things and the process that involved no, that you need to, you can ask a clarifying question, but you cannot answer the question. And talk about that little process. Cause I always remember sitting there thinking, that's a great point. No, don't try to solve it for them. Talk about that little formula a little bit. Yeah. In the, it, when you become a Vistage chair, one of the most important things you learn is issue processing. Because typically when we have a Vistage meeting, you've got you know, 15, 17 CEOs that are in a table, but there's one CEO hosting. And it's their, it's their opportunity to put an issue on the table they're struggling with with their business. So they spend five minutes explaining what the issue is. And then the group has to ask, in your words, clarifying questions about the issue and in no circumstances go into solutionizing mm. until we've fully uncovered and gone deep into the issue. And most cases, David, as you've experienced, the issue that typically someone puts on a table at first is not the real issue. Mm. If you ask the right questions and go deep enough, you end up finding root cause. You end up finding what the real concerns are. And then we can start to develop a little bit more curiosity on the real issue. So it allows, you know, some people call it peeling the onion. Some people call it just digging deep into what's, what's really going on. I love that question. Now, what's really going on? Um, and so asking those questions and, 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 and allowing the person with the issue to fully, fully share what's really going on with that issue without anybody trying to solve it too quickly is a, is a beautiful process. Mm -hmm. And when it's time, and the chair thinks it's time and we've probably exhausted the issue, then we go around and talk about, well, from you know, my experience, similar stuff, this is how I would approach it. So you're not really even giving your solutions then. You're just you're sharing from your own experience what you have done in similar situations. You're not telling that person what they need to do. Right. And that's that, key. That is key. Because mm -hmm. uh, when, when the magic really happens in that process, no one has to tell anybody what they should do. Yeah. Because the person figures that for himself or herself. And I that's think that's also... That's oh, the beauty of asking the right questions. Yeah. And I was thinking this, this was something that uh, I noticed with relationships and personal life or relationships come in, kind of mirror certain things in the professional world and so forth in certain areas. And I noticed that women were always kind of known for don't solve my problem, just listen to me. And I think men have, I certainly have understood that a lot more. Can you just not say anything? Can you just listen to me? Just let me vent and let me kind of get out there. But is it just a human characteristic or something to want to solve the problem? Hence, let me tell you what I think the answer is when we're not done with the clarifying questions, for instance. It is, but I, I still believe that because we've never, we've never been taught how to have a conversation with people. We just haven't. We, you know, we're born on this planet to hunt, kill stuff, and 
do that. You know, we need to solve problems for that. A real conversation, as my friend Gary Lockwood in California would say, the conversation is all about being generally curious about the other person's situation. And I think that is so true because one thing that's a sort of a, a saying within uh, the groups I'm with right now is that, you know, giving advice without permission is abuse. So, you know, we tend to give advice and try to solve problems way too early in the conversation process versus mm -hmm. exploring what's really going on. And if we, if, we, if we just did that a little bit more than what we normally do, we would, we would connect so better and, and I wouldn't be being so abusive because I've given you advice without permission. Mm -hmm. That's being abusive. That's why our gals and our partners at night over the dining table tell us, can you just listen to me? I don't want you to fix things. I just want you to listen to me. And, and they're giving us a hint about be more curious. So did you let say... The, let the silence do some lifting. You know, silence <laughs> is wonderful. <laughs> you say giving advice is abuse? Yeah. I like that. I like that because I was thinking I've... Uh, I don't even like the word advice. I, I just, well, let, Gary, let me give you some advice. You know, it's yeah. like, oh God, I, I my ears just turn over. But, yeah, but giving I, advice without permission. Yeah, well, and especially without permission. Yeah. Now that's, you're right. If somebody says, I'd like your advice, that's different, you know, yeah. so, but without permission. And I think that I even have noticed that uh, I'll say in different workshops I've done, don't ever start a sentence with you have to, you need to, you got to, or you should, especially you should. And, and I get a kick out of people all the time, you know, oh, you're a speaker, you should blank, blank, blank. And I go, wait a minute, are, are you a speaker? Oh, you're not? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks yeah. for the input. I appreciate that. You know, and you let me know when you're a speaker, I'll be happy. to. But it's just even when somebody says, Gary, you have to, you need to, you got to, or especially you should, just look how that are, are we almost the hackles or whatever you want to call it kind of back up because here it comes and I didn't ask for it. And I just, yeah, and I plus, think, telling me what to do versus well, from my experience, this is what I've done in a similar situation. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. a big difference. Yeah. Putting it all on you. I'm saying from my experience, this is how I would handle it. Yeah. Now, you've yeah. got your own way forward and you'll figure it out. But that's just something that I've done for myself. Yeah. But it's, much, it's a very different approach. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say. And I don't, is there, would you, would, with all that experience you've had around that, is there something that you would sort of characterize as here's one or two little tips that I have as a reminder, like how to be asking better questions, how to listen or anything like, like here's three things or anything like that that might be helpful to the listeners. Yeah. First one is ask open-ended questions. Yeah, that's so great. You know, you, you watch interviews on the sports television or yep. uh, the news at night. They ask the stupidest closed ended veiled solution questions. Mm -hmm. Where the other person it just sends up like you know, and I use Tiger Woods as an example because he was brilliant. I mean, they would get these stupid interviewers on, and Tiger would just say, "Yeah, maybe, no," mm -hmm. because it was such a stupid close into question. So asking open-ended questions is critical. Two, short questions. Keep your questions short. So tell me more about that. What's that leading to? Who else could be impacted by that? So. If there was a way forward, what would that look like? We tend to want to blah, 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 and make our questions too elongated, too closed, and too veiled solutionized. And that just gets in our way and doesn't, doesn't open up the conversation, tends to close it down. Uh, what would be a third thing? Um, I think it, it, it's just as hard to learn, but if you can learn the process of asking questions around background, problem, consequence, and value. So the questioning process has a pathway, has a flow. Because, you know, I, I've go out with salespeople quite a bit just to watch them do a sales call. And even if they do ask any questions, and most of them don't, they're pretty poorly planned and so on. They tend to come out like a shotgun approach and they're going back and forward and there's no flow to the conversation. So, you, and I always suggest when I do sales training, just plan your three to five good quality, provocative background questions and let the process follow itself. Mm -hmm. Because once, once you start that, people will just come into the conversation. So, so is that something that you're struggling with? And oh, oh yeah. So tell me more about that. So what is that leading to? 
So what would you know? So where would you go from here? I just asked four question types, and I didn't even know. But there was a flow to the questions. There was a flow to it, and there was a, a rationale behind the flow to the questions. And I'm envisioning this person asking these questions, ask open-ended questions, short questions, tell me more. Short questions, keep them short to the point. Yeah. Yep. yep. And uh, short questions to the point, tell me more, learn the questioning process. Process. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, it's, and so you do those right steps, but then I guess the next step is then, then be quiet and listen and really oh, cool. actively listen. I'm through all that, you're doing a lot of listening. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of, a lot of pausing. Because if I ask you, so tell me more about that, and you you pause to think about how you're going to answer that question, it's really important you just shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. filter that. Yeah. I mean, that's the skill we have to learn too, is to ask a good question. And if they're thinking about their response, which they should be, just let the silence do the heavy lifting for them. Yeah. It's all about them. It's not about you. It's about them. And let, so let them dig deep. Let them think through how they're going to respond to the question. And the more silence, the better. The more silence, the better. I've always liked that term. Let's let let the silence do the heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah. Do the heavy lifting. So I, I just have just because of these things you're saying, I just have sort of a random question. You think about everything you've learned around this subject throughout your entire life and personal development and people and, and what makes them tick and how they can be better listeners and better question askers and so forth. Did you ever notice in your personal life, family, friends, relationships, just anything outside of the work world, did you ever find yourself kind of frustrated with some of the, the people that you would talk to? And it could be a family setting or something when you go, you're not you're not asking open-ended questions or anything where it's not in the workplace, but you know, and they'd say, Gary, don't give us your psycho thing or whatever. What, did you ever just notice that over the, all those years with family and friends? All the time. <laughs> and, and it's not about me saying anything about uh, uh, open-ended questions or anything. It's just people talking over the, over each other all the time. That's the biggest issue I find. I was just at a, a little dinner party recently, a couple of weeks ago. There was only, you know, six of us there. And people just continually, I mean, I was just sitting back listening, trying to absorb what everybody was saying, talking over each other and going in different directions and all that sort of stuff. I mean, that's, that sort of stuff goes on all the time. Now, at a dinner party, you can probably get away with it a little bit. You're not going to stop and say, hey, will you ask me an open new question? No, we won't do that. But it, it, that's the most frustrating thing. When someone's not, if it's not a business setting where I'm controlling the conversation mm. and it's just a social thing, it's a very frustrating thing most of the time. Yeah. Because people, are, most of my clients, and I've got a bundle of them, are terrible listeners. They're terrible. And, you know, they're always giving advice on the smallest little tiny issues that, that surface in a conversation. Well, why didn't you do that? When you get, you know, I mean, it's just nonstop. They've just never been taught how to have a conversation. Yeah. They've just never been taught. And it's interesting to me because uh, people talking over people, and I have to I have to watch myself all the time, let them finish the sentence, let them get and so yes. forth. And I, I use an example where it could be at a dinner party or a social environment. I used to be down at this Columbia Tower Club. And I, I don't know what I'd label this, but I was always fascinated Gary and David were having a conversation and somebody else walks up and, oh, hi, Bob, how are you doing? Good. And I'd say, well, I was just asking Gary about Hawaii. And before I could get the name Hawaii out, Bob goes, well, that's interesting. My wife and I, we were in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago. Hey, Bob, we weren't talking about you. We were talking about Gary. And, and let's let Gary finish before. And somebody really got on me once. They said, man, you're kind of a hard ass. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm just saying, let him finish. Yeah. And when he's done, you can say, well, that's interesting. We happen to be in Hawaii. And then when yes. it's your turn, but, but that you're right, talking over. And as I said, I have to, I just have to really monitor and think. And then now, is that really a pause? And when you said, that's why I love let silence do the lift, the heavy lifting is such a good thing. And even sometimes it's nice to just think about your next question or next yes. response or something. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Is to be seen to my, number one, to be absorbing what I'm telling you or sharing mm -hmm. with you. And then you pausing. And been seen to be thinking about, Gary, that's a really interesting point you're making. 
What did you learn from that? Mm -hmm. You know, and building on. It's all about building on the conversation. Right. Versus stamping on, closing. Because we, we too often close conversations because, well, let me tell you what I did on the weekend. Oh, man, you think you... And mm -hmm. so we... You know, we just want to keep talking about ourselves versus really listening to the other person's story. And I don't know if I'm, I'm not some amateur psychologist or something, but it just appears, that's why I've said several times, uh, let the silence do the heavy lifting. It, there seems to be something about people are not comfortable with silence because like, well, or am I boring you now? We're not saying anything for five or 10 seconds or something. Whereas, as you said, they're maybe taking the comment and digesting it and coming up with their next question. But you can tell because some people will just da, 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 and, and they don't want to have any silence at all. Well, but particularly if you ask a question, this has happened to me numerous times in my career. When you've asked, for example, one of my favorite questions is I'll hear somebody's story and they're getting a little uh, pedantic or getting even angry with some of the responses I might get from my questions. And I, and, I, and I will say something like, so I sense you feel pretty strongly about this. Mm. What's behind that? What, what drives you to think that way about that subject? I've had people just stop, pause and start crying. And when, when, when emotionalism starts coming out in the conversation, I mean, true emotion, when people, you can see people welling up and there's a different body language going on, you You've just got to let it, you've got to let it go quiet. You, you cannot say anything because people are having their moment. And when, and when people are having that moment, they, they're in that really beautiful, vulnerable space of authenticism and you let it just work its magic. So particularly in moments like that, you really, really do. do and, and good good interviewers do that all the, all the time, yeah. but not yeah. many. Not many. Yeah. But it, it's interesting to me, just hearing a couple of comments you've made, it doesn't sound like the vast majority of people get this. It sounds oh, like... Of course not. 99% of the population don't understand this at all. Wow, 99%. Oh, I, I'm a total believer of that. Mm. Very, 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 very few people really have an understanding and know how to have a true conversation with somebody else. Now, yeah. I'm not perfect, that's for sure. I mean, I look at my marriage, I look kids i was over in australia recently with my kids and having trying to have really good conversations about their lives and what they're going to do and what i'm going to do and all that sort of stuff i mean you know i i mess it up sometimes mm -hmm. we all do yeah but i do a lot better than most because at least i will let i'll ask the question at least listen to what's going on and try and take it a little further if i can well as i mentioned earlier whether it was, I think it was offline before we started about whether it was Zoom or in person, when you meet somebody, you instantly like them. And I, and I mentioned that about when I first met you and that smile and that accent and just the, the warmth that you sort of exude. And it's interesting, but I just, I'm beginning to wonder when you say 99%, I, I don't know if there's some things you just can't teach or you can try to teach them that somebody doesn't get it. And I had an example the other day talking to a friend of mine and I was thinking how this person answered this question. And I thought, I would just never say what this person said. And so she told me about the exchange and she said, the gal asked her, uh, you know, what percentage is such and such and such. And so she answered the question and the lady says, you're not answering my question. And I just, I, I just don't think I'd ever say that. I just, I well, don't. I, oh, I do it all the time, David. I mean, if we're having a conversation with somebody and, um, and I've used, I've used that quite a bit. If mm. someone's diverting and you can tell it that not, they don't want to answer your mm -hmm. question. I'll say, look, you're not answering the question I'm asking. Mm -hmm. My question was, well, right. some people deliberately avoid answering the tough right. question. Right. So, oh, no, I will well, challenge people. I will way, challenge people. With that. But the way you asked that was much different than the way that she explained oh, across the screen, in her yeah. face and stuff. So right. I understand because that's, you're right. No, we're, we're, we're diverting is a, good, is a good term yeah. and stuff too. So, uh, well, let me. Especially let me, a client. If a client plays that game with me, I will challenge them and be provocative. I think that's, that's really, that's, really that's not, you know, you just got to, you've got to challenge people to, to go where they need to go, to tell the truth to the best of their knowledge. I mean, what is the truth? Right? But at least get their, their true perspective of what they think is going on. Right. right. And you know, when you hear it, I mean, you, you know, true. when someone's bullshitting or not. Oh, oh gosh, isn't that true? The meter. 
Good. It starts to go off in two. So, well, we've got to wrap up in a few minutes. Yeah. And I want to. Oh, shame. I was enjoying this. I know. I was just going to say, <laughs> in fact, when you read my mind, I was going to go, man, I could go another 45 minutes to an hour and, and not run out of things. It's a fascinating. And I didn't even think about that as much when I knew you were going to be on the podcast. I thought, I want Gary to talk about his, his life and growing up and coming to the States and all the different things you've done. And, and yet, but this whole discussion, and I hope the viewers and listeners think the same thing is very beneficial, very beneficial. Good, so. If you're talking yeah. that 99% don't get it, I would say yeah. that means a lot of people could benefit from the types of things you've said. So let me, and then I'll ask you if you have any other little tidbits and I have a, a final question for you. But some of the things I wrote down is um, learning to be me. You mentioned Jim Rohn, each day working harder on yourself, uh, who you become is so much more valuable. I think that was really cool. Uh, selling was about asking good questions, which mm -hmm. I think- is really excellent. Uh, learning, you said, equals applying newly acquired skills. Was that what that knowledge. was? Knowledge. Applying newly acquired knowledge. Okay, thank you. And then asking the open questions, four types of questions, background questions, problem questions, consequence questions, and then value questions. And I've, I've remembered this from conversations I've had with you in the past that I really like, and I'm going to try to remember this, is what would that look like? Because I just thought that's it's such, a, such a neat way to uh, get it from somebody else. And, and then um, some people never learn to ask the right question. Uh, let's see. Um, a lot of people have never been taught to have a real conversation like that. And then giving advice is abuse. And that's advice without permission. Because it is true. If somebody says, I like your advice, that's a whole different thing. But people just come up and tell you and me stuff all day long. And we didn't ask for it. You know, but they, they think they're, they're benefiting us or something. And then um, asking open and then back to the questions, building on the conversation, ask open-ended questions, short questions, uh, and then the tell me more. In fact, I taught this in one of my sections on listening about the two thing, the two three word phrases that are very valuable is tell me more. And then another one is, and then what? is another good one about that. And they're real short and sweet. And, and I've noticed too, when I've talked to people, if you keep selling, keep saying, tell me more, they will keep telling you more and they will tell you, they'll let you know when they're going to stop. And, but the thing that I've noticed that always makes people laugh, but it's true when I'm done, they'll think you're the greatest person you've ever, they've ever met because all you did is just ask them more about themselves. And well, you'll be genuinely curious. Yeah. I mean, and that's, and that's, yes, exactly. That is so true. It's, and then learn the questioning process too. And then, as I've said several times, uh, let science do uh, science. Let silence do the heavy lifting. And then, and you mentioned you were at a, a party recently and people talking over people. So any other little gems, nuggets I would add, Gary? Oh, you know, I think there's a philosophical uh, way to finish this conversation. And that's, you know, these are life skills. You know, we, we're, we're learning life skills here just to, to live a better life with others. You know, we, we have to learn to play better in the same pit with others all the time and there's one thing to learn to be a rugged individualist which is that's a whole story we can have a separate conversation about but to be a unique team player and to get along with others in the same pit of life these are the skills you have to learn yeah so they're life skills and and so whatever we can do to move forward in our lives to can continually ask yourself what is it that i have to do to learn to be better sharper more conversationalist and, uh, and and to be generally quite frankly to learn to be more genuinely curious about others and their stories and their lives yeah. i think if we just focus on that in being more genuinely curious i think we'd, we'd connect with a lot more people and we'd learn a lot more about other people's lives yeah i believe it was be more genuinely curious about other people so true i yeah. believe it was uh Larry King that said when he was other people, when he was retiring, they said, what's your, what was your biggest tip for new broadcasters or something like that? And he says, you can't learn anything when you're talking about yourself. And I, I just thought that was such a great way to kind of wrap it up. So, well, I thank you so much for being on the podcast. I have my final question for Mr. Polane is yes. what do you know today that you would have liked to have known at 18 that would have helped you? And you could get to pick one thing. Uh, I would go back to what I've said all the way through this, this conversation, Dave, and that is if I had 
known or someone had been in my life that could teach me about these life philosophies, that particularly the Jim Rohns and the Dr. Wayne Dyers and people like that, taught me at the age of 30 and 40. If I had a bit of influence in my life on just getting around people to teach you those life skills at an earlier age, I can only imagine how much more successful I could have been or would have been or whatever, because I, I would have started earlier. Uh, I mean, you know, I started my own business <clears throat> when I was, you know, 40, 41, 42, and I started my own business. And uh, I probably would have had more confidence at a younger age to do something more profound if I had have had these skills earlier. So uh, that's the only thing I would comment on, you know? But I think we, we leave it way too late in our lives to learn the important stuff of life, which is a shame. Life should be backwards. <laughs> Well, that's Stop. like that youth is wasted on the young. I mean, it's just it's just so true. And teach yeah. more life philosophies and life skills. I really like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, I like that. And we, and we just we don't learn the stuff. We learn one plus one equals two. We learn, you know, physics and geometry and all that sort of stuff or whatever. But life skills. Yeah. How yeah. to have a conversation. How to have a conversation. So true. And it's just so interesting. Sometimes I think conversation has always been easy for you. It's always been easy for me. And I think sometimes you just don't think about that much until you come across a person that you can tell really struggles and, and you can just appreciate something that I, I, I can't speak for you, of course, but I've always kind of taken it for granted. I can walk into a room and have a conversation with anybody. And, and it's just, and, and again, I love the try to get all these big nuggets, but to be more genuinely curious, just that alone, and then learn to listen, it would be so helpful. And I, I just have heard this most fascinating stories from people that I'm so glad that I questioned them and asked them and stuff, stuff I never knew. You're kidding. How did, well, tell me, you know, back to the, tell me more, tell me more about that. How did that yeah. impact you? You know, yeah, exactly. it's, it's so interesting. So a lot to learn that way. So, all right, my friend. Well, thank you again. Let me wrap up with the listeners and remind them of a couple of things. As I mentioned earlier, my podcast is downloaded every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on the Transformation Talk Radio Network, available on Apple, Spotify, and Google. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear on the podcast. Always appreciate it. And I know people are struggling with all sorts of life issues, and so they may need additional support. There's all sorts of things going on out there, anxiety, depression, jobs, health, financial, family, and so forth. And I have a gratitude coaching program that can help you to achieve anything your mind can conceive. And so my clients report that it dramatically shortens their learning curve and getting back a, a derailed life back on track again. So I offer a 30-minute coaching consultation to offer some on-the-spot coaching as well as some other little follow-ups to listen and hear what's going on. And if you're interested in that, just text the word COACH to my number 206-371-8309, and I will send you a scheduler link, and then we can get connected for that. So, and as I mentioned earlier, too, I do a lot of gratitude speaking, keynote speaking, and you can get me at that, gratitudeguide.com. So, oh, one last thing, people always like to receive my Monday morning minute. If you'd like to get a 60-second video every Monday morning to inspire you and motivate you for the week around gratitude, Text to the number 22828, that's five digits, 22828, and in the message box, type in the word gratitude guy, all one word, and then that will get you signed up for that. So thank you so much for tuning in. I always appreciate all the viewers and listeners to the weekly podcast, and as I always say, remember, be grateful and never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.